Hello, everyone, and welcome to the UFC 245 six-round post-fight show. I'll be your host tonight, Eddie Mercado, filling in for Zane Simon, who has traveled back to Remulag to Norfolk the Garthog, as he usually does. Uh, but joining me will be the ever-enchanting Dane Fox. Dane, how are you, sir? Uh, doing quite well. Uh, took in a hell of a night of action. How about yourself? Uh, I couldn't be happier. Uh, we got a whole bunch of bangers on this card. Tons of finishes. We had a title change hands. Two successful title defenses. Colby Covington got his jaw broken, more than likely. Um, what's not to love about this card? Like it was, it was action, action, action. Yeah, no, I, I, like you said, what's not to love? I'm trying to stop and think about something that really depressed me. I, I was anticipating maybe Jose Aldo looking like a shell of himself, but hey, even he turned in a, a good performance. So yeah, I'm not going to complain about the night. Yeah, it was it was a phenomenal card in my opinion. Awesome way to end the year. Um, well, let's get right into it. So the main event was an absolute war, a stand-up war, no less, between two accredited wrestlers. Kamaru Usman defeats Colby Covington by late fifth-round TKO. Not a single takedown attempt was to be had. Uh, Colby thinks he broke his jaw in, uh, right before the fourth round, I believe. Yes, it was um, at the end of the third, yep. And, man, these guys just stood and traded. Like, there was no... No feeling out. There was no, you know, clinching. There was no takedown attempts. This was just, you swing at me and I'm going to swing at you and we'll just see what happens. And the durability of Usman and his power is what, what won out here. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, you know, Usman absolutely deserved the win. There, I have seen a few people on the Twitter sphere try to complain that it was uh, uh, an early stoppage on the part of Mark Goddard, which is baloney. It was a good stoppage, if you ask me. Um, but I also want to give props to Covington uh, for his phenomenal performance because both of them stood there, traded just like you said. Um, I can't take my hat off to both of them enough. And the fact that Covington even went back out there after having his jaw broken is impressive enough. So for, for all the crap uh, that he talks, um, even if he did lose, I'm going to say that he, he backed it up tonight in terms of his performance. Didn't quite come out on top. So he's not going to get the, the spoils of the victor, but um, that goes to Usman, obviously. He's the best in the world right now. But I also walk away from this feeling like it could have been different on a different night. Yeah, excellent fight. I think Covington was going for the old Uriah Faber without the thumb up. Just, uh, yep. you know, the classic reach for a single and, and hopes that something will happen. But, yeah, I think it was a good stoppage. Agreed. Um, and yeah, like you said, the fact that Colby even went out there for the fourth round and like not only went out there, but went wounded Tiger and just really started cracking with his lead uppercut and following up with hooks. You know, mm -hmm. Like he, he fought his ass off. Like I'm, yeah. I'm, I, man, tons of heart, tons of toughness. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people <laughs> are probably thrilled that he got his jaw broken since, you know, he is, uh, who talks more than Colby Covington? You know, Conor McGregor, maybe, but not in the same kind of way. So. Uh, yeah, Conor's got a, a, a whimsical charm to him, uh, <laughs> whereas Covington's point. just, he's going out there to cut. He's not trying to be clever or cute or anything like that. He's just cutting. I would watch this fight every day. Like, that's how good it was. <laughs> like, it was just great. Like the versatility of Covington, like he was throwing all sorts of strikes. He was throwing head kicks. He was, you know, pumping his jab, coming up with overhand rights, the lead uppercut, like I was saying. And then Usman, I mean, his jab was popping. That straight right hand was devastating. He started ripping the body, which was visibly hurting Covington. Those front kicks to the body were devastating as well. Um, man, I just can't say enough good things about this fight. Like you, know, you have to go watch this right now. Yeah, and and for all the the talk that people say that Colby doesn't know how to strike, that it's all just a bunch of empty volume, th there were times where he visibly hurt uh, Usman as well with uh, some of those punches. I mean, Usman recovered quickly, but it, it's not like Covington's completely pillow fisted. He he had some power to those strikes. Um, 
it, yeah, and obviously Usman had more power. The, and like you said, I cannot comment on those body strikes enough. I think that was probably the primary difference. But in the end, it's really hard to pinpoint just one thing with this fight. Like you said, it's just it's a tremendous fight, uh, a fight of the year candidate, great way to close out the year. And not enough good things can be said for, for both competitors. Yeah. Amazing performance from both guys. Um, so who do you think will be next in line? You think Usman will, will fight Masvidal or you think Masvidal will do other things? I mean, what do you how do you how do you see Usman moving on from this? Who do you think will be the next challenger? That, that one's hard to say. Uh, if if I'm Masvidal, I probably wouldn't want to go after Usman. Um in large part because Usman is such a nightmare of a matchup for Masvidal. Uh, the problem is, is I don't, I don't. Uh, Leon well, Edwards, I don't think I it's don't that think. he's a nightmare matchup. I think it's just he's not a he's not the biggest payday out there. I think that's the reality of it. And that's I think, true too. No, I, I, that's a trying, better point. He's trying that's to get a, paid. Yeah, no, and and that's a better point. I think that's kind of what kind of what I was saying was if I'm Masvidal, I don't know if I do that because right now, Masvidal's in in the driver's seat. He he can do whatever he wants. Uh, if he feels like a fight with Nick Diaz is going to make him more money, he'll he'll go after Nick Diaz. And I, I think you're right. I don't think Usman is the money fight for him right now. So maybe if uh, Tyron Woodley and Leon, Leon Edwards dance, then the winner of that will get the next shot. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a possibility. I mean, it's it isn't nearly as uh, sexy as what Masvidal would be for Usman, but um, doesn't it, it, you know, doesn't it feel like Masvidal's the champion? <laughs> in many ways, yeah. You know, uh, it's it's it, he's got that. Like I said, he's in the driver's seat. He's in the position that McGregor had a couple of years ago, where basically everything he touches turns to gold. So he's. He's he's in the envious position right now. Um, the thing is, though, like if I could see Covington getting a win or two back, and then we're right back where we were as far as Covington and Usman going at it again. Honestly, I don't think I'd want to see Usman fight anybody but Covington again. It, it, if it turns, yeah, if it's if it turns out something like this, I'm I'm 100 with you again. You know, I mean, you've said multiple times, can we just have Joe Lozon and Jim Miller on every card? If we could yeah. have Bruce and Covington <laughs> on every card, I think a big reason for that is the fact that they're both such great wrestlers that they don't even bother with it and they just stand and bang. I feel like anyone else, Usman's going to go back to leaning on the wrestling. I think this was the first time we saw Usman just actually say. I'm going to stand and I'm going to trade and that's just it. Mm -hmm. And I can't see him doing that with anybody else because he doesn't have to. Yeah. I also think it's a a matter of pride between these two. Um, They, they just, dislike each other so much that I think that it was a point of pride that they just wanted to punch each other in the jaw and, and hopefully break it. And obviously Usman succeeded in that. So yeah, I wonder how long Colby's going to be out with that kind of injury. Because that, you know, that's no joke. Yeah, no that that's the main reason why I was I was thinking about backing up my statement of you know give Colby another win or two and he could be right back there. But ugh, you know, and you know, as much as people dislike Colby, uh, it was a bit surprising to hear the crowd chanting his name a couple of times. So in other words, he's he's got a base. That if they wanted to make that fight again, it's not an impossibility. I mean, I'm a Colby Covington fan. I'll say it. I uh, I picked him to win here. So did I. So, you know, I I see through the shtick. No, I I agree. I, it is I it is a shtick. You know, I, I watched his uh, interview, whether it was last week. I can't remember or earlier this week, but yeah, it's a shtick. <laughs> Like I've interviewed him a couple times in the past and like he was always the nicest dude and um, just not the Colby we know and, and have come to see. And, you know, he's he, he did what he had to do to get a name out there and it got him it got him this far on top of being able to fight his ass off because, you know, he could fight. But yep. who, who knows how long he'll be out and who he'll get matched up with next. That'll, I think yep. that'll be very interesting. Yeah, people will probably curse me on the Twitter sphere, but hopefully he heals up soon. All right, so let's move to the co-main event. 
and new featherweight champion Alexander Volkanovsky outstriking Max Holloway to win a unanimous decision. I think one judge gave him all five rounds. Um, wow, did Volkanovsky show up. I was stoked because I picked him to win, and he did. People thought I was crazy, but he uh, he was able to overcome the reach. He was able to really focus in on those low calf kicks early on in the fight. Yep. Uh, he was able to bob his head and come over the top with punches and uh, really – prevented Holloway from getting his volume off and didn't let Holloway push the tempo and pressure early in the fight. And he got ahead enough on the scorecards and he was doing enough damage and Holloway had moments, but it just wasn't enough for the blessed era to continue. I am kind of kicking myself because I considered picking him for the exact reasons that you said. Um, he's, he's very strategic in the cage. I, should have learned that lesson with Aldo because he completely shut down Aldo in their fight together. But I, I just, when it came down to it, I told myself, but it's Max Holloway. He just, he overwhelms everybody. And Volkanovsky's game plan was perfect. He just continued to attack the leg. It prevented uh, Max from getting into a rhythm. And without Max being able to get into a rhythm, he, he had to rely on spurts. And and that's not Holloway, whereas Volkanovski just continued to chip away. It was masterful. Yeah, those leg kicks actually caused Holloway to switch stances yep. uh, for like two rounds. And uh, and when he switched stances, Volkanovski started to attack the other leg. So it, it was really a mass – the best striking I've seen out of Volkanovski thus far for sure. Um, wasn't exactly how I thought it was going to go down. I thought there were, there was going to be a lot more clinch work, a lot more grinding against the cage. Mm -hmm. But Holloway was actually able to shut all that down. Not that Volkanovski went to that a lot, but the times he did, Holloway was quick to get his back off the cage. So that was very impressive on Holloway's part. I, I think I think Volkanovski wanted to avoid uh, uh, Holloway's offense off the breaks. Because Holloway's always been very good, you know, like after you clinch or after a scramble or something like that. Holloway's always been very good about landing a quick combination or something like that, which would help him establish a rhythm. So I, I didn't think about it until afterwards, but I think that's the reason why Volkanovski avoided that type of uh, attack. Yeah, it was a masterful performance, like yep. excellent game plan. He stuck to it um, despite not needing the takedowns at all. He, he was able to outstrike Max Holloway, and I can't believe it just said that. But <laughs> I feel the exact same way. He shocked the world. Even yeah, though I picked him to win. He still shocked the world. The way he won was just unexpected, I'll say. Yeah, it, it isn't just whether or not somebody gets the victory. It's how they get the victory, and that's completely what it was in this case. What's crazy is at first when he was when Volkanovski was was playing so far outside, I was like, oh no, like what is he doing? Like you don't want to be that you're, you're at range against someone longer and taller than you. Like that's yep. that's not a good idea. But he knew what he was doing. He was in and out. He he came in. He landed his strikes. He got out of way, out of the way, not allowing Holloway to pressure forward. And like that's kind of one of the keys to Holloway's success is being able to pressure forward with volume. Mm -hmm. And Volkanovski just found a way to remove that aspect. And like you said, that's that's not Holloway. No, no. D and d beware of Australian MMA. I mean, at this point, they're yep. they're claiming uh, all sorts of title belts, and the only people who can take them down are fellow Aussies. So, yeah, Volkanovski, man, he's a he's a hoss. He's a, you know he he has the heart of a heavyweight. He's he's a true heavyweight. <laughs> <laughs> like somehow makes 145 pounds, you know, like he played rugby at 240 pounds, trimmed down, started fighting. And now he's the world featherweight champion. Like that's mind boggling, mm -hmm. completely mm -hmm. mind boggling. So uh, let me ask you this. Okay. The greatest featherweight of all time, Max Holloway, does he deserve an instant rematch? <sighs> The question I have is whether or not Holloway wants to move up to lightweight. If he wants to stay at featherweight, I say yes, because I don't feel that there's a ready contender otherwise. Because, you know, I don't think Zabit's quite ready. Um, I don't think Yair's quite ready. 
Well, so I would say yes. There's always the winner of uh, Korean Zombie and Frankie Edgar that goes on next weekend. Uh, true, true. Um, but, uh, that would be I, I, that would only be two wins in a row, if I'm not mistaken, for uh, the Korean Zombie, though. Yeah, but it's the zombie. <laughs> He he does get that leeway. I will admit well, it, that it was going to be Zombie and Brian Ortega, but Ortega's out. Yeah. So with Ortega out and Aldo now at bantamweight, that really kind of bumps up the beat. Yeah. You know, right there. Like, why not? Like, if they want to make that fight, I'm totally okay with that. I think that's an interesting matchup. Someone who's long and rangy, um, but can also wrestle. So I think Volkanovski and Magomed Sharapov is a, a real interesting proposition. Well, it, if, it's also uh, Magomed Sharapov's unorthodoxy. Like, the guy is incredibly creative, whereas Holloway and Aldo, though they can be explosive, they very much have a distinct pattern. And I think that might be a more difficult matchup for Volkanovski. Yeah, that's if Holloway doesn't get the immediate rematch, which I True. think he deserves. Like, if I'm, I'm with he's that. earned it, he's definitely yes. earned it. If he wants it, give it to him. Man, but Volkanovski definitely impressed tonight, um, showing off just a really a well versed striking attack. You know, he was attacking both legs. He was, you know, the way he his entries to his punches were just so savvy. You know, he did get clipped, but you know that's to be expected when with someone who is a as great at Max Holloway as Max Holloway is at striking, but against someone so rangy where he had to really use a lot of gas to close the distance and leap in with his strikes and then leap back out of, out of the way, you know, he showed off a tremendous gas tank. Like he slowed down a little bit there in the fifth, but nowhere to the point where he was ever, you know, sucking wind or, you know, fatigued to the point where he was just backing up and running away like he or, or shooting desperate takedowns like his his gas tank held up considering all that volume yeah no, uh, the, the only thing that he did in the fit that indicated that he was tired was uh clinched up against the fence for for a while other than that he was on his on his toes you know able to counter uh, holloway's attack as holloway realized he was behind on the cards and had to to move forward so yeah volkanovsky it wasn't a flashy performance but it's a workmanlike performance that's deserving of high praise. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, what do you think about Holloway moving up to lightweight, though? You know, after watching him against Poirier, I'm kind of like, yeah, I don't know if I want to see Holloway at lightweight. Uh, uh, he, uh, he's he got a, a massive frame for featherweight, and I understand that that's been a uh, big part of his success. But I, I fear that it could... Uh, that it's going to get more difficult. I mean, I, I know that I've seen my butt grow bigger as I get older without changing <laughs> my diet. So I'm sure that he's having the same problem, but I, I would just think that at some point he might want to do that sooner rather than later, because we all know that extreme weight cutting, the more that you do it, the more damage that it does to your body. So yeah. I would think that would be something Holloway would want to consider. But again, you know, he, he knows his body. I'm sure that he's working with nutritionists, uh, or at least I would hope he is. And we'll see what he does. I, I wouldn't be surprised either way if he decides to stay a featherweight or lightweight. Yeah. And I mean, he, he's already has a lot of wins over guys at, at featherweight. So it's not like the competition is too steep there. You yeah. know, he, he put a beat on Ortega he he stopped Aldo twice. You know he's he's ridiculous. So wherever he goes next, I, I'm down for a, another immediate rematch. For me, that'd probably be the most exciting fight. But I guess we'll see. Yeah. All right. On to the third title fight of the evening: uh, women's bantamweight bout. Amanda Nunes successfully defending her title in the rematch against Jermaine Durandamy, leaning on her wrestling to secure a unanimous decision. Um, there were moments where she was in hot water. GDR was coming alive. She was landing heavy strikes. She uh, landed that big question mark kick, uh, really solid knees in the Muay Thai clinch. Uh, but Nunes fought exceptionally smart 
She went to the double leg that GDR just could not stop, um, took top position, stayed busy enough on top to not get stood up after that very first one, um, and just really put on a veteran performance here. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said veteran. I wasn't thinking that, but now that you've said that, I do think that is the perfect explanation for it. Um, like you said, and she, she, well, she made adjustments as she went to, you know, she allowed GDR back up in the second round. GDR hits that question mark kick. And then from that point on, Nunez wanted to have nothing to do with the, uh, with the stand up. She got a little bit risky with some of her positioning on the ground. And then uh, GDR threatens with the triangle in the fourth round. Nunez starts to play it a lot more safe with her <laughs> positioning at that point. You know, it, it was a very smart performance. Um, much like Volkanovski, that it wasn't very flashy, but it was very smart, very, very intelligent. Um, and in the end, it got the done, got the job done. Excuse me, and proved why. Nunez it, it continues to get showered with uh, accolades of being the greatest women's fighter of all time. Yeah, I mean, she has to be. Um, but yes, very, like you said, that smart. This was a smart performance. You know, she came out looking to bang, and then the second she was like, okay, this is, uh, this might not be my path to victory here, despite her having tremendous success already, just putting hands on people, getting them out of there in the first round. She was like, okay, I need to go ahead and use my other tools mm-hmm. that people may have forgotten about. And because uh, the first time they fought, Amanda Nunes took top control and pounded her out. Yep. Um, this time she took top control, wasn't able to get the finish. Um, but it went all five rounds. Uh, this was the first time in a while that it has gone the distance for her. The odds makers had – this was the only title fight that the odds makers had finishing early, and it it didn't. And Nunez did not gas out. Um, like I said, she was in hot water a couple times, even with that up kick there mm-hmm. that GDR hit. Like that was a pretty mean – that was a devastating blow, but Nunes was able to recover. She maintained the position. Like you were talking about that triangle, she fought her way out of it and still managed to take the top position. Yep. Um, she she just outclassed GDR in the grappling department, and she removed Jermaine Durandamy from her wheelhouse, took the fight where Nunes could flourish, and just fought a well-rounded fight. Like mm-hmm. she's, who's, who's better than Amanda Nunes? You know, pound for pound, greatest of all time. There's no female fighter that is better, period. Yeah. It's it's not up for debate. You know, and let's give credit to, to GDR as well. You know, the first time they fought, she, she didn't even make it out of the first round. Uh, now, um, Nunez is at the peak of her powers, and GDR was able to go the distance with her. I, I'm not saying that her her grappling was impressive from the offensive standpoint, but for lar- large chunks of time, she was able to uh, smother Nunez's offenses to the to the point where she she didn't take as bad of a beating as I would have expected, con- considering how much top control Nunez had. Yeah, I think a lot of that was. Um, was Nunes just trying to play it safe and, and fight smart and not put mm-hmm. herself in these positions where she's getting up kicked or getting put in triangles. Uh, I think she just started to respect the ground game of GDR enough to where she wasn't going to take gigantic risks. She was going to chip away with short shots, small elbows and, and not really try to posture up and go crazy um, because she didn't have to like just controlling from the top and doing enough to not get stood up won her the fight Uh excellent performance in in that respect for sure but yeah gdr was game she had she had her her window of opportunity she just couldn't capitalize on it and not being able to stop a double leg is you know at this level it's just that's a that's a tall order right there well, it, it, one fun stat with regards to that, the the last person who had taken down GDR was Nunez, and that was six years ago. So it, I don't know if that's more of a reflection on how poor her opposition was or how much she had improved, but maybe a combination of both most likely. But, you know, it, it's not like she's been taken down willy-nilly by all of her op- opposition up to this point. 
Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, she's also been fighting like once a year, and uh, that does make it easy to stay up. And, and fighting strikers like Holly Holmes not coming to take her down and knocking people out in the first round. Not, not much yeah. room for that. Yeah. What, what was who was the other one? Uh, was it Pennington? That's right. That's right. Michael Pennington. Pennington. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then you know, sixteen second knockout of Aspen Lad. <laughs> not much time uh, for for uh, stuffing takedowns, yeah. but yeah, she was she did her best to control the posture and not get finished. Uh, so credit to GDR for that. Um, but what do you do with Nunez? What do you do with her? Oh God, that's uh, that's the million dollar question at this point because there's there's nothing on the immediate horizon to realistically challenge her, you know, or I should say any sort of bankable challenge. Featherweight has pretty much always been a fair, barren wasteland. And now that Cyborg is in Bellator, uh, there's no realistic challenge for her there. Um, at Bantamweight, the most likely challenger, uh, Vieira, who we'll get to later, lost. So that kind of shoots that down. I, I have no clue what to do with Nunes in the immediate future. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe Irene Aldana, like you were alluding to, um, you got Juliana Pena out there, but like no one you're really like excited for. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, un- that's unfortunate. Um, Aspen lad, you know, she, she's back there now, but she just had her little win. Um, yeah, but Gianna Kunitz guy at Nunes is a huge jump. Yeah, it's tough. I don't know. Like, I honestly don't know. Uh, For me, the biggest fight is Shevchenko. Oh, that absolutely is. Um, a trilogy. But the thing, the funny thing about that is, is that they would essentially be tying up three belts in one fight. Yeah, but I mean, is the featherweight belt really? There's not even like a division there. It, True, true. I'm, I'm not saying that there is much of a division, but it is a third belt. <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't know. Um, if Megan Anderson can put together a, D, a a win, maybe I have no clue. Like I said, it's really hard to say. I I'm with you on Shevchenko. That is the fight I would like to see Nunez do the most. Uh, the question is 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 Nunez willing to say I'll fight her for a third time? Yeah, and, and Chevchenko has that fight with Caitlin Chikagian coming up in uh, February. So yeah, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing is like both of them are so they're just leaps and bounds ahead of their divisions that you just and like their fights against each other were phenomenal. Like they're really close bouts. Yes. So. <laughs> Honestly, that's really all I want to see. Yeah, you know, I, I'm with you. If if Shevchenko can get past UK again, uh, it's not like there's a contender on the horizon in her division either. I would say why not? I just I, I've got a gut feeling that Nunez would probably say I've already beat her twice, and she's the one with the ability to say yes or no at this point. This is true. I don't know what they'll do. Maybe Aspen Lad. I don't know. <laughs> But good on Nunes, solidifying her spot as just the very best women's fighter that we've ever seen. Yeah, absolutely. What can you say? Well, we can talk about the guy who used to be the greatest featherweight fighter of all time. Uh, well, let's get to that then. So <laughs> Jose Aldo dropped down to Bantamweight, uh, losing a razor-thin split decision over Marlon Marais. Uh I thought Aldo won this one, man. I really did. Uh, Morais came out strong in the opening round, landing those lead head kicks right away. That was rocking Aldo. Aldo rallied in the second and just started putting on Morais with the pressure, with the volume. He was aggressive. Third round comes, and it's it's pretty close. Aldo was pressuring. I thought he did enough. Um I mean, the strike count, I think, was just one it was it was one strike difference. Um, and I feel like when it's that close, you got to go to the guy that's pressuring. Like, isn't that the criteria? Effective striking, grappling, octagon control. Like, isn't that the, isn't that how it goes? Uh, I believe it's whoever did the most damage 
you know, regardless of what the the volume was, if you felt damage was done more one way or the other. Well, sure, damage is always number one. But. Mm-hmm. And, and and if you can't decide after that, you're you're absolutely right with regards to the octagon control. I. I scored it in favor of Marais, but I have absolutely no problem with somebody going in favor of Aldo. Like you said, it was it was razor thin. I I thought Marais shots had a little bit more oomph to them, but you know, I mean, at this point, we're splitting hairs. Yeah, that's <laughs> you know, true. We, we might as well debate what's what uh, M and M's taste better: the red ones or the green ones? Very fair. Or is water wet? Yeah. Yeah. Man, but I got to say, Aldo looked good at 35. Yes, yes. I was, a lot of people were counting him out. I was in a little group chat with uh, some of my some of my training teammates, and they were all like, oh, Aldo's going to get KO'd by the second round. Aldo's going to get KO'd. And I'm like, no, he's not. Like, I don't, I don't see that happening. Like, he's only been knocked out by taller strikers. And Max Holloway and Conor McGregor are the only two that have knocked him out. And... I think that's a big part of this move down to Bantamweight is I think he just he can do better when the guys he's fighting aren't as as tall and rangy and lanky as some of those guys at Featherweight. And, and he gets to play the bully. Yeah, and and that's that's so much more fun for me is watching Aldo like this, you know, and he was able to eat those shots. Like yes, he was wobbled in that opening round, but he handled it. Like he was able to eat it and and keep moving. Mm-hmm. And just the way he was being so aggressive just really tickled my fancy. I really like seeing that. Yes. No, I, I was one of those that was hating this move for Aldo. You know, the, it, there had been talk about him uh, changing divisions when he was at featherweight forever. But the talk was always about him going to lightweight. So, you know, seeing him drop down here. In addition to how TJ Dillashaw looked when he dropped down to flyweight, you know, I, I expected the worst for for Aldo as well, and I'm happy to say that it didn't happen. He looked good, and I'll shut my mouth about this being a mistake at this point. You know, I it, it opens up all sorts of possibilities for Aldo moving forward. It really does. I mean, I guess you got to ask how many times can he make the weight class. I guess that's a reasonable argument, you know, that he's only got so many left in him. Mm-hmm. Uh, so immediately after the fight on the microphone, Marais said that he was willing to grant an immediate rematch, which is totally cool with me. I would love to see them run it back since it was so close, such a compelling fight. Mm-hmm. Like that's definitely okay with me. Um, and especially since I think uh, in terms of title shots, uh, we'll get to that in a second, but yep. I think uh, Jan might have solidified himself as the guy. Um, but yeah, I, I was a little heartbroken. I think like the fan inside of me, and like I'm a Marlon Marais fan. Like I've been following him since the World Series of Fighting. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I'm a big fat Jose Aldo Mark. So like, I, part of me was like probably biased. And, and like just wanting him to win and and maybe just his aggression is what made me feel like he was winning that third round. But like the strike count was so close that it, it was far from a robbery. This was re- really was just a razor thin split decision. And like yeah. maybe this should have been a five rounder. Like if this were a five rounder, maybe we would have got a definitive answer. And maybe that's maybe what they need to do is is main event this, make this a main event somewhere like in Brazil and let them go five rounds to determine an actual winner. Yeah, you you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say if they do rematch this, let's let's make it go five rounds, especially given uh, neither of them are particularly known for their effectiveness over over five rounds. You know, Marais gassed in his five round contest with Cejudo. Aldo has been notorious for flagging late in his five round contests as well. I, I say that's the the best way to go if they do run it back. Um, if they don't run it back, though, uh, what direction do they go with them? Um. Well, man. So. For Marais, he's uh, <laughs> Peter so, Jan deserves a title shot. Like I will, that's just how I feel about it. You got Corey Sanhagen's out there also, so maybe Marais could go up against him. 
that's that's highly compelling for me. San Hagen has just been on a tear, an absolute tear. Took the division by storm, really. Uh huh. Floating around out there. Uh-huh. Either uh-huh. one of those. Yeah, I was going to say there, there's a couple of wild cards, you know, like maybe something like uh, uh, Rob Font or something like that. But even then, I feel like Font's a little bit too far down there. But I, I feel like if they don't do the rematch and Aldo stays at 135, I feel like there's an obvious perfect matchup for him waiting out there. And that's Uriah Pedro. Faber? No, Munoz. Uh, really? I, I would like to see him against Uriah Faber again. Uh, Faber, Faber's 40. And I think, I mean, don't get me wrong for a 40 year old, he looked good, but mm, I just feel like Munoz and Aldo would be gold. It would, it would definitely be gold. Um, but I feel like the bigger fight would be Faber and Aldo again. There is more name value there. I will admit that, but heck we could get Ken Shamrock and Tito Ortiz to run it back <laughs> again. And that have had more name value. Well, shoot. They probably are in combate or something. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. Tito's probably shooting for it. Like Tito did just fight Chuck Liddell recently. Let's not forget. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think an immediate rematch is in order. Make it a five rounder, make it in Rio. I think everyone wins in that situation. Agreed. All right. So moving on to the main card opener, Peter Yawn looked absolutely phenomenal, winning by head kick knockout in the third round, taking out Uriah Faber, the California kid who's on his new stint in the UFC. And man, right away, Yawn was just backing up Faber with pressure, not even having to throw a strike. He was just fainting and moving, and Faber was just overreacting to every single little thing that Yawn did. And then Come round two, good lord, Jan just started to put it on Faber. Like he started to let his hands go, just dropped them twice. And uh, Faber was just, he was outclassed in this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it wasn't close at all. And how do you feel about the referees allowing the, the fight to continue after that first stoppage? You know, they, they checked the cut on Faber uh, towards the end of the second round, and they let it go. Did, did you feel that was justified? Yeah, I mean, Faber seemed to be fine. It's not like he was wobbled. Uh, like, he, he had his wits about him when they were checking the cut. Like, the cut looked bad, but and he was swelling up. But, I mean, he seemed to be okay. Yeah. No, it, the, the swelling is what worried me more. Uh, like, it, if it continued to swell... You know, I, it's one of those things that I kind of fear about what would happen. I mean, don't get me wrong. I understand that most of the times when we've had a hematoma shoot up like that, it traditionally hasn't exploded as we fear it might. But it was it was something I was a little worried about. But thank goodness nothing did happen. And, well, nothing happened until Jan just obliterated him in the third. But <laughs> Yeah, that head kick was something special. Like it was like an it was weird. It was almost like he was trying to throw a knee, but was like, ah, eh, he's a little far away, so I'll just throw the up kick. Yeah. And it just it landed right on the butt chin and favor was done. And I'm just glad John didn't have to follow up with any unnecessary strikes. I'm glad they called it right then and there. The last thing I wanted to see is uh, a dazed and confused Uriah Favor taking uh, unnecessary punishment. Yep. I, I was going to say that in all the years that Faber has been fighting, I've, I've never seen a look on his face quite like the one that he had after Jan just obliterated him with that kick. You know, he, because Faber is one of the toughest SOBs this sport has seen. So, um, yeah, yeah, excellent win for Peter Jan. I think he deserves the next title shot. Shout out to Tiger Muay Thai. All right, let's get into the undercard. Jeff Neal put on an impressive 90 second dismantling of Mike Perry, rocking him with the head kick, finishing with the flurry. Uh, first guy to to stop Mike Perry like that. Um, wow, Jeff Neal is the truth. <laughs> yes, uh, further proof of the awesomeness of Fortis MMA. Uh, the guy just looks unstoppable right now. Um, landed that uh, head kick upside. Uh, Mike Perry's head sent him stumbling across the cage and did what many deemed to be impossible and put down Perry with strikes. Yeah, Perry is no slouch. He's tough as nails. He can bang, but Neil is just really next level. Like he he picks his shots wisely. He he doesn't spaz out and I'm I'm blown away. Like he's 
he has put the welterweight division on notice. He says yeah. on, on the mic, a couple more fights, and he's ready for a title. And he's on his way, man. He's definitely on his way. No, no, he's he was smooth as hell in there. Um, props to uh, Joe Rogan uh, or or Daniel Cormier. I can't remember which one of them, but one of them suggested the idea of having him face Ponzinibbio next, and that would definitely be something I'd be down for. That would be a banger. I would also be okay if he fought Stephen Thompson. Either one of those. Mm-hmm. That one crossed my mind as well. All right, let's uh, let's get cracking. We're, we've already been running our mouths way too long on this. Uh, <laughs> Irene Aldana knocking out Ketlin Vieira in her return to action. Uh, four minutes, 51 seconds into the first round. Vieira comes out throwing heavy leather, looking good, landing all the shots. Aldana stuck to the game plan. She didn't get desperate. She trusted in herself, trusted her skills, landed a beautiful left hook that just slumped Vieira, landed maybe two ground strikes, and Ketlin was unconscious. One of the biggest complaints that uh, a lot of people have had with Aldana is that she doesn't sit down on her strikes uh, very much. And and this is why people have been wanting her to do that. You know, she finally just clobbered Vieira like Vieira's eyes were crossed as she hit the ground. It was the type of knockout that you rarely see within women's MMA. And it's precisely why people have been so excited about Aldana. So uh, by far her her masterpiece in the cage at this point yeah and and this one alone could get her a shot at nunez you know first round knockouts don't really come too often in the division as you were saying so take two people who are beyond capable of doing it let them go at it let the chips fall where they may Mm, i I would be okay with that i i may throw a uh wrench in there and say that i'd like to see a number one contenders fight between her and pena but I could also understand if they just threw Aldana in there as well. You know, they've got to have somebody to challenge for the belt. They got to do something just yep. to keep the the division churning, so to speak. But excellent win for Aldana. Bit yes. of a coming out party for her power. All right. So before that, we had Omari Akhmadov taking a unanimous decision over Ian Heinish. Heinish was scrappy. He was down. But the counters counters of Akhmadov were really the story here. Anytime Ian would come in. Akhmadov would counter with with nice nice combinations. Uh, probably like the the lamest fight on the card, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I'll agree with that. Um, not not much to take away from this one, so we're just gonna go ahead and move on. <laughs> Unless you have something you would like to add. Um, H- Heinish just telegraphs everything too much. You know, Akhmadov saw it all coming, which is why he was able to effectively counter, and Heinish didn't make a run until Akhmadov was, was tired. So, Yeah. All right, so before that, the return of the immortal Matt Brown coming up with the second round TKO of Ben Saunders. Uh, Brown comes out, hits his beautiful trip, gets on top, but Saunders instantly goes to his 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu rubber guard, uh, locks up some funky stuff, finds himself locking up a triangle that he like kept switching sides with and held on for pretty much the entire first round, possibly gassing out his legs. Second round comes, Brown hits that same trip, gets on top of Saunders, lands some brutal, brutal, brutal ground strikes and put Saunders away. Yeah. Um, I love Ben Saunders. He's somebody that I've enjoyed watching uh, since he was on the Ultimate Fighter uh, throughout his uh, run in Bellator as well. But at this point, he has lost six of his last seven and five of those six losses by a knockout. I I don't have any desire to see him in there anymore. I hope that he's got something that he can rely on outside of the fight game, but I, that's the biggest takeaway for this for me. Um, besides that, though, happy to see Matt Brown come back after two years away. You know, he's he's still got uh, that instinct for violence. And it's something that, fortunately for us as fight fans, I don't think is ever gonna going to leave Matt Brown. Yeah, who doesn't love violence, right? That's why we all watch this sport. Uh, yeah, but our true. producer, Steph Haynes, just uh, sent a tweet over. Looks like uh, Dana White just said that Henry Cejudo gave him a call saying that Jose Aldo won that fight and he wants to fight him next. So oh, God. whether or not that happens, who knows? I'm cool with it. Like, why not? 
Um, well, because Peter Jan should probably get the title shot. <laughs> but like I said earlier, I'm a, I'm a Aldo Mark. So well, we're also forgetting the fact that Cejudo has an entire belt that he uh, hasn't defended in in almost a year at this point either. So yeah, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. Strip it or have him defend it. It's prize fighting. The rankings don't really matter. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. Uh, closing out uh, the early prelims, you had 20-year-old Chase Hooper coming up with the first round TKO of Daniel Tamor. My dude is 20 years old, looking like Screech out there, just doing his thing, <laughs> not trying to stand and bang it out uh, like we see him do in the past, uh, doing everything he could to get the fight to the ground. Locked up the mounted triangle, dropped a whole bunch of vicious elbows and punches, splitting over ta- splitting open Tamor, and uh, coming away with a, a big win in his UFC debut. Yeah, he he looked a little jittery at the beginning. Uh, Tamer caught him in the guillotine, and uh, there were times where he was just standing in front of Tamer. Um, but you know, he got punched in the face a couple of times, which woke him up. And then he just, he absolutely dominated Tamer on the ground once he got him there. And it was a hell of an impressive win for the kid. Yeah. He's got a really strong skill set with the grappling, uh, obviously needs to definitely tighten up his stand up, um, especially mm-hmm. in this division, but a lot of promise. The dude's only 20 years old. He's 90 no right now. Uh, the sky's the limit. Uh, hopefully he got his M&Ms like he was requesting with the fro on him. <laughs> yeah, he's not 20 years old at all, talking about M&Ms. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, there could be worse things he, he could be doing at 20 years old. I know oh, I probably was. Totally, totally agree. Totally agree. <laughs> uh, one of my, my one of my favorite tweets of the night that I saw was somebody saying that uh, Hooper is, um, oh shit, Sean O'Malley before he uh, discovered weed. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious uh, and accurate. Uh, but yeah, sky's the limit for this kid. Hopefully he stays the course and just keeps evolving, getting better. Uh, so it looks like we have some. Uh, wow. Fight of the night, Kamara Usman and Colby Covington. No surprise there is an absolute banger. Performance of the night, Peter Yan, Irene Aldana, uh, Saunders. Saunders got a performance bonus. Uh, Faber, Covington, Broken Draw, transported to the hospital. Okay. So, yeah, Covington's probably going to get his mouth wired shut, which I'm sure will make a lot of people happy. (laughs) Oh, wait. It's saying Saunders, Faber, and Covington went to the hospital. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Usman and Covington fight at the night performance of the night, Jan and Aldana. So that makes sense. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Two bodacious knockouts. All right. So uh low key fight of the night for some Preliminary fight of the night, I'll say. Brandon Moreno taking a unanimous decision over Kai Kara France. And these two guys just stood in front of each other and had a really high-level kickboxing bout. Uh, Kara France got off early, had a real successful opening round. And then Moreno came on strong in the second and uh, continued on in the third. I mean, this was really fun for me to watch. Just flyweights. This is flyweight. Like, this is... When I think of flyweight, this is what I think of. Usman and Covington were fighting like flyweights, to be quite honest, with the kind of volume they were throwing. <laughs> I, I like that. I like that. I wouldn't have thought to say that, but that's completely true, you know? Uh, th- there's a reason why everybody thought that Dana White was insane when he said that he wanted to get rid of the flyweight division. I mean, how the hell can you not enjoy the the, the pace that Moreno and Cara France set? Uh, it, it, was, it was crazy. It was insane. I'm shocked that that Moreno didn't slow down at all because Cara France did in, in the end. I, I think that's what uh, gave Moreno the decision is he just had a little bit left in the, a little bit more left in the gas tank. Yeah, a little more in the gas tank. Started showboating there in the at the end of the third round, which I thought was fun. Um, yep. Man, I really liked the way he was finishing his combinations with that left head kick. Um, it wasn't landing completely clean, but it was a great way to. Um, address Kara France backing up after the first two punches that Moreno was throwing. I thought that was real technical, real smart of him to throw. And, uh, man, I would watch these two guys fight every day, honestly. 
yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun for me. And and I, I love the progress that Moreno has made since he first came into the UFC. Yeah, the kid is right before our eyes developing into the the contender that many of us thought that that he would be. So very happy to see that. But and at the same time, all the props in the world to Cara France because his performance was phenomenal as well, even in a loss. Yeah, they both look phenomenal here. All right, so before that, women's flyweight, kind of, because Jessica I missed weight by five pounds. But either way, she took a unanimous decision over Vivian Arajo. Um, real veteran performance. She was the one who was mixing up her striking attack. Arajo was kind of just looking to land hands and get takedowns, and I was the one throwing hands and throwing kicks, uh, both to the body, to the leg. Um, real veteran performance from I. You know, she was ranked, what, number two in the world. So this was a big step up for Arajo, but, uh, you know, she just wasn't quite there yet. No. In all honesty, if it weren't for the fact that I missed weight by five pounds, I would be inclined to call this the most complete performance of her career. Uh, she faced some adversity in the first round. Uh, I gave the first round to Araujo. Mm-hmm. Um but I stayed the course, whereas in the past she would kind of shell up and just more or less try to put everything into one strike or something like that, as opposed to continuing to work her strategy. But she stayed the course this time. She she attacked Araujo's uh, lead leg to the point where she was forced to change things up. Like you said, just a truly veteran performance out of I, who is – not known for putting together veteran performances. Yeah, this was this was definitely good to see outside of missing weight by five pounds. That's almost inexcusable. Um, but you know, we'll see we'll see where she goes from here. Maybe she'll make weight next time. She 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 seems to have things clicking in terms of her game and her her camp and everything going on behind the scenes. Uh, so if she can just get that weight cut in order, who knows? She might be uh, marching her way back into contention even though she's kind of already in contention, but missing weight doesn't do anything for that. You. All right, so opening up the card, uh, Punahili Soriano came out with the beautiful knockout of Oscar Pachota. Uh, three minutes and 17 seconds into the fight, Soriano just throws with bad intentions, and Oscar, he just leaves his chin there to be hit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Soriano has power. <laughs> I mean, it, we knew that uh, even coming into this fight, it's not like his power necessarily surprised us. But it, the the problem is, is that Pia Hoda has no defense whatsoever. Um, he's not riding a three fight losing streak. I don't see uh, the UFC bringing him back because it's not like he has any massive long term potential or anything like that. Whereas Soriano looks like he can. I don't see him becoming a contender, but he could be a Mike Perry type in the sense that he will just throw down with anybody and he can put anybody to sleep. That, that goes a long way at middleweight, though. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So it was definitely good to see. Strong debut. Um, and this was one of those like video game knockouts. Like the dude oh, completely yes. spun around. He was slumped. Uh, excellent performance from Soriano. All right, let's uh, go on back to the top of the card. Uh, the stacked UFC 245 card. I mean, Usman defending his championship in an epic war with Colby Covington. Um, way better than anyone had ever anticipated, I will say. Uh, they just stood and banged it out as long as it lasted. Four minutes and 10 seconds into the fifth round, Usman finally got two knockdowns, finished with ground strikes. Um, excellent performance from both guys, really. Covington fighting through a broken jaw, which is tough. Like, yep. what? <laughs> Who does that? Um, Alexander Volkanovsky dethroning Max Holloway as the featherweight champion, ending the blessed era, starting the Volkanovsky era. Uh, who challenges who will challenge him next we'll see it might be holloway it might be someone new either way australia is doing its thing and then of course amanda nunez uh proving that she is the goat and she can win in more ways than just quick knockout uh using her wrestling beating gdr one more time 
We had Marlon Moraes, Jose Aldo putting on a fun fight, going the distance, razor split, razor thin split decision for Moraes. Aldo actually looking good at 135, despite a lot of people not thinking he would. A lot of people were thinking he was fragile and cutting weight, you know, makes you more vulnerable to getting knocked out. But Aldo uh, actually surprised a lot of people and might get a shot at Henry Cejudo because Cejudo wants that, but who knows? And then, of course, Peter Yan with the head kick knockout of Uriah Faber, uh, proving that he is elite, one of the best in the world, knocking on the door of a title shot. Just an over, overall spectacular card. Uh, the last pay per view of the year finished strong. Uh, I, I'm completely and utterly just stoked on this entire event. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, If it isn't event of the year, it's at least a contender for it. Off the top of my head, I'm I'm struggling to think of one that might top it. Uh, Last month's possibly could be up there, UFC 244, but I'd probably give a slight edge to this one. Well, on that note, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, I'll be back next weekend. I think Zane will be back. Uh, Well, maybe not because we have that early UFC Korea card, Frankie Edgar versus the Korean Zombie. So whether or not there'll be a sixth round is up in the air. Um, but until then, you can find me over on Twitter at the Eddie Mercado. You can find Dane on Twitter at the Dane Fox. Uh, until then, go be a good person.